thanks for joining us today. I'm Mary Elizabeth Larson, Vice President of Communications and Membership for CADCA. Methamphetamine is a drug that makes people stay awake for days, causes them to pick their skin to the bone, and it ruins lives. According to numbers from 2004 from the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, 1.4 million people 12 years or older used meth in the previous year. That's 600,000 in the past month. All drugs change lives, but this one change, changes entire neighborhoods, towns, and states. During the next hour, we'll see how coalitions can fight methamphetamine and melt the ice. Let's start with Jim Wingo, a sergeant with the Missouri State Highway Patrol and his agency's Clan Lad Training Coordinator. Jim, welcome Hi, to Mary. the program. How are you? First, let's talk just basics. What is meth? Uh, methamphetamine is a stimulant, uh, similar to cocaine, uh, only the more um, uh, stronger, actually, in its effects than cocaine. Now, how long have you been working on the meth problem? Uh, in the Missouri area, uh, Kansas City area specifically, where I work, it's been a big problem for us, and I've uh, specifically targeted methamphetamine for about the last 17 years. So it's been a problem the entire time you've been working narcotics? Yes, it has. Okay. Well, now, why has it become such an epidemic? Uh, be actually, because of the type of methamphetamine that we're seeing. It's so much stronger, so much potent than it was, say, 20 years ago. Okay. Now, what are, the, what are some of the short-term effects of methamphetamine? What are you seeing? Uh, short-term effects of methamphetamine are going to be things like increased alertness, uh, decreased appetite, uh, and it produces, more importantly, a very pleasurable feeling, gives increased euphoria. And what about long-term? Uh, the long-term effects, uh, unfortunately, are going to uh, include things like depression, anxiety, uh, and what we call meth psychosis. You know, that sounds really awful. Uh, so why would this drug be so popular? Uh, the reason it's so popular because actually because it makes the user feel so good. It, it really does. Uh, I'll have people tell me uh, over and over again that uh, methamphetamine actually gave them more pleasurable, th more pleasure than actually anything they ever did in their lives. But how how long does it take to go from those short-term effects that might give them pleasure to those long-term effects that sound really scary well it's going to be different for for different people but uh, unfortunately uh, uh, what slowly happens is is a user uses methamphetamine enjoys the effects and it leads the user to believe that they're actually in control of their lives um, and they can do things uh, much better than they could not using methamphetamine their uh, uh, their ability to uh, be alert and get things accomplished is much better using methamphetamine so they feel like they're in control of their lives but slowly what happens is is the drug uh, gets control and if uh, once a user tries to stop using the drugs all those pleasurable feelings that they were feeling before uh, there's actually a reverse and equally opposite negative effect of the methamphetamine now if you pull someone over um, what would be some of the physical effects or what would you look for in, in, uh, in someone to, to say, mm, I think they might be on meth? Uh, well, one of the uh, uh, more noticeable uh, effects of methamphetamine is a condition on the skin. Uh, the doctors call it. It's called formication, but uh, we refer to it as crank bugs. And what happens is the nerve endings in the skin get very, very sensitive, and they'll be scratching, picking uh, a little sores in their, in their faces, on their hands and uh, that's a good outward sign but uh, uh, somebody's using methamphetamine is going to be very talkative um, uh, uh, and, and trying to talk you uh, virtually to death uh, on the opposite end what happens what we see often is that uh, you'll stop somebody officers will stop somebody arrest somebody bring them back to their patrol car and when they come back to check on them they're asleep which is not typically a normal reaction for somebody under arrest <laughs> right. so that's always a good indication because they've come down or they're I mean what is it they've just well they uh, uh, because it increases alertness uh, uh, users can stay awake literally for days if not weeks and 
on the opposite end once they stop using the drug or eventually what happens is uh, they'll use the drug but it, it's not supplying the, the pleasurable effects that they were getting in it after you've been awake for a week or two. You need your sleep. You need your <laughs> sleep and, and they'll sleep literally for days and you can't wake them up. Now what are some of the ways that people are making meth? What do they use to make this drug? Uh, the most common method uh, in the U.S., and it has been for about the last 17 years, is what we call the ephedrine reduction method. And right now there are two versions of that method that we see predominantly in the United States. One would be what we call the red phosphorus method, using uh, uh, red phosphorus, iodine crystals, and either ephedrine or pseudoephedrine and what we call the Nazi method, which use, utilizes also ephedrine or pseudoephedrine, but then a couple other chemicals like anhydrous ammonia or lithium. Okay, what is a precursor? We hear a lot about precursors to meth. Uh, uh, the precursor is the uh, uh, drug uh, ephedrine or pseudoephedrine in this method. It's actually going to be converted from its uh, a chemical state of ephedrine or pseudoephedrine actually be converted to methamphetamine. Uh, along with it, there are uh, reagent chemicals, uh, other things that are used in the process. What's the difference between meth and ice? You know, we're talking about melting the ice here. Ice, ice seems to be the, the big problem, but actually uh, you could uh, uh, compare ice. Uh, ice would be to methamphetamine as crack is to cocaine. It, it actually is methamphetamine, but what has been uh, done to the meth is actually being converted to its pure form which then allows it to be smoked, which is the best way to get a psychoactive stimulant like methamphetamine or crack cocaine uh, to the brain and, and get that really strong, pleasurable feeling. Right. So ice is actually a pure form of methamphetamine. And the smoked uh, form of intake might be uh, more, more widely acceptable among drug users. Uh, yeah, uh, I mean, uh, smoking actually... Uh, uh, it will uh, uh, get the drug to the brain in its purest form as possible. So that's why uh, uh, smoking the drug that, that we have now, because it's in its pure form, leads to that dependency a lot faster. And that's why it's so hard to quit. So when you're doing uh, clan lab investigations, um, what are you seeing? What are some of the common household items that you're seeing? Uh, and you know, that's the unfortunate thing about it is Everything you need to make methamphetamine can be purchased locally from local stores. None of it is uh, illegal to possess and can be purchased locally. So we'll find things like uh, for the ephedrine, pseudoephedrine, obviously uh, pseudoephed tablets uh, or any kind of generic brand like that. But we're also seeing uh, things for uh, uh, the red phosphorus, things like uh, matchbooks, because match uh, red phosphorus can be scraped from the uh, uh, strike plates of matchbooks, uh, iodine tincture, uh, sodium hydroxide, or red devil lye. Uh, we see a lot of acids, muriatic acid, sulfuric acid, uh, drain cleaners, basically, is, is what they are, and a lot of solvents, uh, acetone, toluene, or what's really scary is ether, a very volatile solvent. So what is a clan lab exactly? I should back up and, and ask that question for the audience because hear about clan labs. What is that really? Uh, well, the, uh, the college definition is just a, a sufficient combination of chemicals, equipment, apparatus that can be used in the manufacture of methamphetamine. And it sounds like it's something that's really elaborate yeah. and something that would take a lot of... But basically a meth lab could consist literally of a bucket and a spoon. It doesn't take a lot of equipment. Uh, so what we're talking about basically is, is a sufficient amount of chemicals uh, that we just talked about or spatulas, uh, Pyrex cookware, coffee pots, things like that. Uh, and because you get a preconceived notion of what a lab is and it's common ordinary household items basically. Now, where are you usually finding clan labs? We find meth labs absolutely everywhere. Everywhere, from houses, uh, barns, vacant buildings. You know, I sometimes tell people, you take a, a map of the United States, put it on a wall, right. 
cover your eyes, throw a dart, that's where you'll right. find a meth lab everywhere. Well, that's why we're doing this show, because meth labs can be in your neighborhood. So thanks, Jim. Law enforcement and community coalitions are well aware of the meth problem, but many people don't have a clue about it. One program in Kansas is trying to change all that. And even though it started small, it expanded around the country. Correspondent Tiffany Sherman tells us all about Meth Watch. Methamphetamine has overshadowed everything uh, in Kansas on the drug front. We've had to focus a disproportionate amount of our resources and manpower and, and everything else on meth and meth labs. Larry Welch has been the director of the Kansas Bureau of Investigation since 1994 and has seen drug trends come and go, but nothing like this. Methamphetamine has changed everything. Uh, nothing has ever impacted the Kansas criminal justice system in my opinion, as much as methamphetamine. So in towns all over Kansas, the Kansas Methamphetamine Prevention Project and its Meth Watch program are trying to make a dent in the problem before it even reaches the criminal justice system, attacking it from a community level. Meth Watch is one of many components of a comprehensive approach for addressing methamphetamine that we recommend, and it's really served as a vehicle for communities one of the main components of the Meth Watch program involves retailers like hardware stores. They have a lot of the supplies they sell, muriatic acid, acetone, other types of solvents, and they sell a lot of times auto supplies like gas line additives, starter, starting fluid, things like that, and so it's really important. The shelves in the Ace Hardware store in Council Grove, Kansas, have small Meth Watch tags on them. These products are on the list of potential items that, that can be purchased to, in the, for the manufacture meth. The shelf tags are all over the aisle of solvents and near the lithium batteries, camping fuels, and matches, and even on items as seemingly innocent as coffee filters. It's a way for the stores to both inform and warn customers. The people here know that, no, you're not going to get that stuff. If, you want to, if you're going to do that stuff, you're going to have to go somewhere else. Also part of the program, Posters near time clocks are in break rooms that remind employees about what ingredients go into making meth. Tear-off pads near cash registers that explain the program to customers. And signs on the doors that identify the retailer as a participant. We've really had great response no matter the size of the retailer. It, we've had all of our large corporations, our large retailer corporations statewide come on board. We have every retailer in the state and then we have small mom and pop type stores that are involved as well. So it's really been across the board. Um, there really haven't been any stores that didn't want to be involved once they found out the purpose of the program. Pharmacies are also involved, even the little ones with big missions. I am um, the only pharmacy actually in the county here in Morris County. There's about 6,000 people and um, we're the only pharmacy here. And You want to have a little bit of everything but not too much of anything because of the fact that you are the only place. Every shelf in the store is full, but one doesn't have any products on it, just small cards. Anything with Sudafed in it basically needs to be behind the counter. There's a couple products with just a little bit of Sudafed we can leave out, but almost all the Sudafed products we've moved back, which cuts your cough and cold section about in half. The room where the cough and cold products are kept has MethWatch signage in it, and logos are also up near where customers sign for their products. These are small steps, but ones that business leaders say are worth it. The Meth Watch program, I think, really pushed this whole thing into the front light of businesses because before it came out, everyone had the deniability to say, we have nothing to do with it. We have no control over what this person goes and does on their own time. Um, the Meth Watch program, I think, kind of said, hey, you know, you have something you can do about this, pro this problem. And you have a little bit of ownership in trying to control and stop it. It's an expensive and deadly problem. There's also a videotape for each employee to watch, containing information about what to look for, what to do if they encounter someone suspicious, and safety information. Because of retail's high turnover rate, the video is a simple way to train new people easily. 
the retail component is a piece that is easily implemented. The resources are available um, free of charge. It, for a small amount of funding, people can get the products printed, things like that. Street signs are also part of the program, showing people coming into towns like Council Grove that the people there are serious about fighting methamphetamine. People are aware of what uh, to watch for, of smells for meth labs, uh, increased traffic. We have made them aware of what's going on. Also, people just care, and I think less and less they're afraid to tell families if they suspect one of their children uh, getting involved in some illicit uh, drug. The reach of meth watch in Council Grove has spread to places you might not expect, into restaurants, like the Hayes House, the longest continuously operating restaurant west of the Mississippi River. We recently developed table toppers to distribute to restaurants throughout the state. Um, the table toppers have information about the basics of meth labs, what you might see if you were to spot a meth lab in your neighborhood, including information about where they might be found. We also have information about indicators that an individual may be using methamphetamine, and then finally a lot of information about the social consequences of methamphetamine to help to illustrate how it really can touch all aspects of our communities. And there's some sectors of our society who may not get this information through traditional channels, like coming to a town hall meeting or getting a newsletter or having their child bring home something in their backpack from their school. But some of these people may come to restaurants, so this is one other way that we can help to capture attention and educate people about the problem. The restaurants in the community have been very open to this as well as the factories and the uh, rural communities and they welcome this because after all it impacts their employees and their employees families and the whole community is impacted if we have a meth epidemic. There's proof the meth watch program is working. Retailers say people don't seem to be stealing as much but the evaluation goes further. What we did was a case study of four counties that were high implementing counties and one of those was the most urban county in our state and then um, three more rural counties, although one is where a major university is located and looked at the efforts that they implemented and we saw significant reductions in youth usage, specifically among seniors in high school. We also saw reductions in perceived availability of meth in those communities as well that were able to really thoroughly implement meth watch and other prevention efforts. Other states and prevention groups can implement the program with permission from the Kansas Department of Health and Environment. Just go to the group's website www.kansasmethwatch.com for information. One thing that I think is essential is that the logo remains consistent and so we maintain the logo and then the state just adds their own state name to the logo so that it's consistent. If you're driving across state borders, you're going to see the same signage. We've got about 30 to 35 trademark license agreements signed and the entire country of Canada, all the provinces. It's really been amazing. People are really just can't get enough of the supplies. They're very excited about the program and really I think one of the benefits of the program is it really gives people a way, it gives retailers a way to get involved, but really gives community coalitions a vehicle for getting retailers and other businesses involved. And getting involved is the first step towards success on small town streets or anywhere else. Well, Tom Pagel has joined us now. He's the chief of police in Casper, Wyoming, and he developed the Wyoming Methamphetamine Initiative during his dozen years as the director of his state's Division of Criminal Investigations. Tom and Jim, we just saw this great meth watch piece. What do you guys have to say about it? You can never have too much community awareness. Your, your communities have to be educated to the problems of meth before you're going to be able to move ahead and, and fix, improve things. Yeah, what a great program. I, I look at the, uh, the stores that are involved and the signage in, on the aisles, and what a great uh, a program to, to help educate people on what to look for. You're going to get it implemented in uh, Missouri, I'm right? I'm going to start tomorrow. <laughs> well, I have to say I'm proud because I'm a Kansan, so it's great that that program started in my home state. Well, now, a program like that, it looks great. The community's involved. Could there be any downside to the Meth Watch program? 
that you can see? I, I don't think so. Like I say, the more the more educated your public is, the, the better it is. Uh, you, you have to understand your problem before you're able to address it. And you've modified that program? What's been going on in Casper? We, we have dealt a lot with our retailers, but we've also taken it a step further and gone to our uh, hotel motel operators as well as our landlord associations have done training with them as to what to look for. Many times they're the ones, they'll see something in an apartment or in a house they're renting uh, and, and previously would just clean it up or move on and didn't even realize what they were seeing. So uh, for both the safety factor as well as information for law enforcement, we've trained them too. That's great. Well, Tom, now that we have you on board, um, let's talk a little bit about what you're doing in Casper because I know it's phenomenal. Let's start at the very beginning. When did you start dealing with methamphetamine as a law enforcement officer? Well, I think I, as when I was director for our State Division of Criminal Investigation in 1992, I gave my first talk on meth and said, we aren't sure what this is, but it's coming like a freight train. And unfortunately, we were correct. And it has is, is continued to impact the West. Now it's in the Midwest. It's moving east. And it's a huge problem. And as it moves the populate, as it hits the population centers east, uh, we're in for a rough ride. Now in Casper, what was the first thing that you all did? How long ago did you start dealing with meth in a, in a systematic way? I, I had been there for about a year when we took down a meth lab diagonally across the street from one of our elementary schools. Uh, and due to various reasons, we chose to evacuate the school. Uh, there were some people that were critical of that move, and it was obvious to me that there, there needed to be an education factor. So we educated the public through the newspapers to why we had done that and then called a meeting. We called 40 of our community leaders that we handpicked into a luncheon and gave them kind of meth 101 as to what the situation was. That evolved into our meth watch committee, which three years down the road we are still uh, meeting on a monthly basis. On a monthly basis in a coalition approach. Yes. And why is it important that everyone be involved? Well. You cannot work independently on meth. Your law enforcement efforts are going to affect your treatment efforts, are going to affect your prevention efforts, your schools, your hospitals, uh, your, your foster care. Everybody is impacted by this. Uh, your workforce development. So y you have to have all of those players at the table. And one of the things that we haven't talked about yet, guys, is the environmental hazards. And I know you probably see it. Um, what are some of the environmental issues with meth? Yeah. Well, uh, as the saying goes, for every pound of methamphetamine made, you have five to seven pounds of hazardous waste produced. And that hazardous waste has to go somewhere. If it's not being dumped directly outside into the ground, then it's being poured down the sinks, uh, down the toilets uh, of the residence or motel room that they're at. So uh, they're not calling a hazardous waste collection facility to come pick that up. It's going somewhere, and it's going maybe in the bathtubs where they're actually bathing their children. So. It's pretty dramatic stuff. Do you think that talking about the environment is, is opening up the dialogue for people who think, oh, meth isn't my problem? Well, what, what we are finding is when we go into a residence uh, where we're finding a meth lab or meth activity and we're finding little kids in there, and the impact then that you're seeing on the, both medical and psychological on the little kids as well as a projected impact on them on special education costs and whatnot in the schools it is yet to be determined, but it's going to be a huge cost. It's dramatic. And we did a, we did a show a couple of years ago on drug-endangered children, which has now become a term that people understand. And there are sometimes laws and protocols. Do you guys know of any in your states that are to, to deal with drug-endangered children? One of the things that we're doing there is we have a joint uh, program with the police, our probation parole officers, and our Department of Family Service. If someone comes in with a hot EUA with probation parole, all three agencies respond at the same time. That individual is revoked, the kids are taken into protective custody, and then the police will deal with the, with the legal matters of it. But too many times in the past, the agencies have worked independently, and the kids have slipped through the cracks and have not been addressed. And that's the, just says how powerful this drug is, that people would, uh, you know, uh, endanger and abuse their children uh, to be involved with it. Let's talk about how we go back with the coalition approach. Um, data is important. We, we always tell, CADCA always tells coalitions, you've got to start with local data. You know, every community has their own unique drug problems. And if you don't know what's happening, you don't have those statistics. But people aren't statisticians. 
So how have you addressed that issue in Casper? Well, you're exactly right. And one of the biggest challenges is pulling the data together from all the various disciplines. Your school districts, your hospitals, your treatment providers, law enforcement, the courts, the drug courts. Everybody uses a different software program. Uh, it's not all compatible. One of the things we're looking at is pulling our, our community college into the mix, too. So they're doing some help with data collection. Yes. Good deal. Okay, guys. We'll get back to you in a moment. Meth hits especially hard in rural areas, as we've discussed. You know, it used to be farmers just worried about rain once they got their crops in the ground. But now, because of the meth problem, farmers need to worry about someone stealing a dangerous chemical from their farms, anhydrous ammonia. As correspondent Tiffany Sherman tells us, one Meth Watch program is trying to put a stop to the thefts, and the program is something any group could adopt. Inside these tanks is something you can't see, but you can certainly smell. Anhydrous ammonia is a gas that puts nitrogen into farmland, adding nutrients for better crops. That's your main building block. There's three of them for it. To raise a good crop is nitrogen, phosphorus, and potash, and then some trace minerals. But if you don't have nitrogen there, you, you just won't raise much. Kansas farmer Steve Hennessy takes good care of his anhydrous tank, keeping it close to his home and the road so he can keep an eye on it. He takes it out to the fields only when he needs it and knows from personal experience that people steal the gas to make meth. We've had a little trouble with somebody happened to be the tanks were empty so they really didn't steal anything. They, they just messed with them and left their paraphernalia that they collected in because they didn't have any. I guess they didn't want it anymore. About everybody you talk to has had Somebody's been there once or twice anyway that tried to steal some. They'd find the hose messed with or gone or something like that. Tennessee and thousands of other farmers in Kansas participate in the Meth Watch program, putting decals, tamper tags, and locks on their tanks. There's just the tremendous demand for our decals. They don't want hookers in their neighborhood. They want to let people know who are planning on tampering with their tank that they're aware of meth cooking. They're aware of the effects of meth and they're supporting the program and they know what actions to take should they find somebody messing with their tanks. The locks take things a step further, making it almost impossible for someone to open the valves to steal anhydrous ammonia. So we're putting on approximately right out 140 locks in the county because that's how many anhydrous tanks we have in the county. When you screw it down with the top here, that means that no anhydrous can escape from the hoses from the tank. You lift it up and everyone is keyed separate. What you do is you insert it here. When you've got it tight, it comes out. You keep it in a very safe spot. When you're ready to go to the field, put on anhydrous, you unscrew it, release the gas, full bore, but it's automatically locked in. The same locks also help at the ammonia refilling sites. STE Ag Services on the outskirts of Topeka sells fertilizers to area farmers. The company has dozens of anhydrous ammonia tanks on the property and has seen its share of theft. Two years ago, we were probably having, uh, in the springtime, three or four a week. Methwatch paid for locks for most of the tanks. The rest are in the works. Thanks to the locks and the stickers, the number of thefts has gone down. Probably this spring I've had, oh, uh, maybe three incidents. They was in several tanks, four or five tanks when they did it, and it was ones that we didn't have locks on yet. Without the funding from Methwatch, STE Ag probably would not have purchased locks. It's a very low margin industry and just we have about 70 tanks and the tanks locks are running about 80 to 100 dollars away I understand. But programs like MethWatch are making a difference in Kansas and across the country. This message is getting out through these programs to these people that they could be anywhere so help us watch for them. Our fight against meth labs is getting easier. 
and we're seeing greater results again because of meth watch we're getting a better handle on meth labs but we haven't eliminated our meth problem in kansas since the kansas methamphetamine prevention project and meth watch began they have distributed about thirty thousand tank stickers and about twenty thousand tamper tags states and organizations can adopt this program all you need to do is get a signed agreement from the Kansas Department of Health and Environment. You can find all the information at www.kansasmethwatch.com. So what do you guys think? I like those locks. We've uh, actually, uh, 10 years ago, we saw a similar type of locking uh, mechanism actually would cover all of the valves and it was heavy and it was cumbersome. Yeah. And, and while I mean it would prevent somebody from getting into the unit farmers didn't like to use it because uh, they had to continually open this big cover to get into that and this is a much more simple uh, locking mechanism so right. I really like it are you dealing with anhydrous ammonia in your community any of the any of the rural states uh, particularly in the West uh, those tanks have had virtually no value to anybody before have been left on ranches and farms for years and and now they're uh, uh, a desirable item in meth. One of the interesting things about this piece, the farmer told us that he puts, his, they put their tanks out right by the highway, by, by the road with that big meth watch sticker. And you'd think, oh, those tanks are kind of unsightly. You know, you'd want to hide those back behind the trees. But that's another part of the awareness is getting that out there. And they can also catch the bad guys if it's out in the open, right? That, that's one of my bread and butters is we'll take a group of guys on a regular basis and we'll go to co-ops like that where anhydrous ammonia is being stolen and we'll sit and we'll wait and we'll watch for the anhydrous ammonia thieves to come and steal some anhydrous ammonia. Well, this is a dangerous action, though, on the farm, right? I mean, this can be dangerous to the farmer if his tank has been tampered with. Now, what, you know, what, what's the toxic... Well, we've had several incidences in Missouri where anhydrous ammonia thieves have come in to steal anhydrous ammonia and have left the valves open and have virtually evacuated half of a town just because of this ammonia leak. Wow. You're, you're also at risk when they put it like in a propane gas tank and we'll use those and then if they turn that tank in and you end up getting it uh, at, at one of the sites, that can be a problem for you too. Wow, tough. Tough issue, but looks like they're making some headway with the uh, Meth Watch program. Well, we're going to take a short break. <coughs> okay, do you smoke? No. Do you drink alcohol regularly? No. He won't tell her that he's been inhaling crystal meth. Deep breath. Because he doesn't know. <coughs> the house he moved into was once a crystal meth lab and is still toxic. I'll be right back. So, who has the drug problem now? Find out how meth affects you at drugfree.org slash meth. This is my blog entry. I love when my dad and I cook breakfast together. He always called me his honey. But then he started using the kitchen to make meth. One night the police came in with white suits and gas masks. I was taken to the hospital and decontaminated. I haven't seen my dad since. Well, the images we've seen of meth are shocking, and so are the stories behind them. Vicki Sickles has one of those stories. She's a former meth addict and a treatment success story. Her treatment worked, but it was a long road to get there. Vicki Sickles is a counselor with the Methamphetamine Clinical Trials Group at Iowa Health Des Moines. Vicki, when did you first start using drugs? I first started experimenting with drugs and alcohol when I was uh, in high school. And then I graduated and went to college where I was out from underneath the roof of my parents and I really applied myself to um, experimenting, trying everything that came down the path. Mm -hmm. um, so by the time I graduated from college, I thought that I'd tried almost everything there was. But you hadn't tried meth? I hadn't yet even heard of meth. When did, you, when did meth become a problem in your life? I'd been out of college for about a year and a half, and um, it was 1988. My father had recently passed, and I was sort of at odds, didn't know kind of what to do with myself, and I was um, a singer in a lounge, and someone came to see my act and 
bought me a couple of drinks and said, hey, would you like to try a line of crank? And I said, what's that? He said, oh, it's like speed. I'll just chop up a little line. Just give it a try. Wow. Mm -hmm. Now, what were some of the negative consequences from the times that you were using meth? Um, the negative consequences, it didn't, didn't occur for a while. I mean, when I first started using it, it was, it gave me energy, I was creative, I was productive, I could forget about my grief, I could forget about the fact that I didn't know what I was doing with my life, and I thought it was great. But right away, I started to feel um, crazy and obsessive, and um, I wasn't going anywhere, didn't have any real direction in my life. And that was just at the beginning. At, at, at first, after I first used it for a few months, I knew that I wasn't going anywhere with it, and I moved away from the town that I was doing it in. It was later in my addiction when the really serious things started to occur. So what were some of the, the serious aspects? Were you ever arrested? Um, I was arrested. I was arrested not on drug charges, but on an assault charge. And I'm a very peaceful person. I don't fight, but wow. um, I knocked a woman down in front of a deputy sheriff because I, she, was, she was mean and I was crazy. And so wow. um, went to, I was arrested and put in jail overnight on an assault charge. But I was um, evicted more than once. I was fired from every job I had for like the five years that I was really, really intensely doing methamphetamine. I was, um, I nearly lost custody of my child. Fortunately, my family stepped in and helped me out there. Um, I was committed. I was robbed. I was beaten. It was, the list goes on and on. I was homeless for a time. So through all that, how did you seek treatment? It was never that I decided to go to treatment. I never just woke up one morning and said, oh, I've had enough of this, I'm going to go to treatment. I mean, it would be in my mind. I'm not having any fun with this anymore. It's wrecking my life. But I wasn't, I didn't have, you know, it really affects your brain and the way you think about things. So the first time I went to treatment, it was because my family noticed that I was not taking good care of, care of my son, who was mm -hmm. three at the time. And they said, you need to do something for yourself or we're going to take him from you. So that, at that time, was enough to get me into treatment. Um, but that only lasted for about six months. And um, that was because the treatment that I went to was about 28 days long, the inpatient treatment. And then they suggested that I go to a halfway house. And I said, oh, no, I don't need that. I have a house. I have right. a small child. And I, I didn't do it. So that, that recovery period lasted for about six months. And then at the end of that six months, I was very depressed, which I now know um, that your dopamine is affected. Um, Jim Mingo talked about the dopamine and how people feel just great. They feel more pleasure than they've ever, ever felt. It's because meth floods your brain with dopamine. But what happens then is your brain stops producing dopamine on its own. So it can take a year, up to two years, for your brain to start producing the dopamine that naturally makes you feel good about things. So six months into my recovery, I didn't have that information. Right. And I was very depressed, and I relapsed. And, um, and then I stayed in relapse for about five years before I finally got into recovery for a final time. And what was the type of treatment that finally worked for you? It was long-term residential treatment that finally, the 28 days was not enough. I had to go to the halfway house right. and spend the 90 days just learning how to live again. And now you help other people live again. So it's a, you're applying what you've learned in, in your life lessons now right. to help other people. It's really rewarding to be able to give meaning to that life experience. But the thing that I had that I see a lot of people that I work with don't have was resources. I had a supportive family. After I spent 90 days in the halfway house, I then spent about three years living at my sister's. And, and she was able to support me while I went to school and, and, and got a career that mattered to me. A lot of people don't have that. They go home to families that are also using. Wow, what an environment to go home to. Right. You know. Now, your, your work in treatment, um, what are you seeing as far as um, the people that come in? You know, there's sort of this thought that meth is very difficult to treat, so let's, let's put that myth out there on the table and deal with it. Right, and um, meth is difficult to treat, and it is different than other things. There are, you know, if someone comes in and they haven't been sleeping, you know, they haven't been eating, so they need rest, they need nutrition, they need, and we are on an outpatient basis in many places. You know, a lot of meth addicts are unemployed and uninsured. So you know, there's only certain kinds of treatment that they can afford. But if you can get somebody into treatment, which is you know, kind of tricky sometimes to get people even to come to treatment, and then you can keep them there long enough, treatment does work. And you're working on some research right now. Why don't you tell us about that? Right. I am fortunate enough to be working um, with the Methamphetamine Clinical Trials Group. This is a NIDA-funded a program. We have five test sites throughout the country and they're looking for some kind of medication that will help get people through that period of withdrawal and craving while their dopamine is, uh, their brain starting to produce dopamine again. 
Um, we've tested, the, the drug that we've had the most success with so far is bupropion, which is Welbutrin or Zyban, mm -hmm. and it's shown some real positive results for people who are low-end meth users. It really helps people get off and stay off methamphetamine, so they're going to continue those trials. So the NIDA, and we should say NIDA is the National Institute on Drug Abuse, right, which some of right. our viewers might know, not mm -hmm. know, but uh, the NIDA research is looking at, um, there's different kinds of treatment, right? There's, there's right. therapy, behavioral therapy. Tell us about that. Right. Um, the behavioral therapy that we use through this research program is the matrix model of cognitive behavioral therapy. It's great for methamphetamine addicts because it's very hands-on tools for um, uh, staying, getting off and staying off meth. One of the things that they talk about is scheduling so that you can provide structure because, you know, when I came into treatment, I hadn't worked for five years. I mean, you know, I'd held a job for a couple of months, then I'd be fired. So you lose control of time and how to organize your time. So that's one of the tools. Um, identifying triggers, what triggers you to use and think about using, and then eliminating those triggers or um, using thought-stopping techniques to, to avoid cravings. There's real hands-on tools for meth addicts. Well, Vicki, clearly you're in the right work, and I appreciate you coming and telling us a little bit about that, and we'll talk more with you during the roundtable. So right. thank, you. thank you. It's time for another break. When we come back, we'll see how one prevention partnership is using shock value to keep kids from trying meth, even once. The toxic fumes from this meth lab are seeping into Jamie's sinus cavity. Ammonia vapors invade her throat. Toxic gases fill her lungs. Jamie's body is deteriorating. And she doesn't even know it. Jamie, dinner. So, who has the drug problem now? Find out how meth affects you at drugfree.org slash meth. The public service announcements we just saw send a strong message, but one philanthropist is funding a project that takes an entirely different tone. The PSAs from the Montana Meth Project are shocking, and the project's funder, Tom Seibel, believes they are working. Don't do it. We're addressing young people aged 12 to 17, and our hope is to dramatically reduce first-time methamphetamine use in that audience. A television advertising is designed to break through the clutter and graphically communicate the risks of meth use. Stop looking at me! Our theme is really focusing upon the issue of not even once. This wasn't supposed to be your life! Not even once. Don't even try it once. I mean, so many young people in Montana, their lives have been destroyed after first-time use. Every one of our TV ads, every one of our billboards, every one of our Internet ads, the call to action is not even once. It's amazing what you can accomplish when you're on meth. The first manifestation of this messaging saw the light of day uh, September 1st, 2005, yeah. when we became the largest advertiser there. in the state of Montana. Yeah, so down. between September 1st and the end of 2005, we released roughly 18,000 minutes of TV advertising. 18,000 minutes of radio advertising. We're in movie theaters, we're on billboards, we're in the newspapers. This is saturation level advertising. The community's response to the meth project has been simply overwhelming. We have high school students and high school classes from Butte, Montana, sending letters to the editor saying, don't take down these ads, continue this program. This is critically important. I'm only going to try meth once. I'm, I'm not going to be like that guy. Two weeks after release, 
adcritic.com ranked these ads among the top 20 advertisements in America. Just once. All right, I'm not going to be like that guy. I'm, I'm, I'm not going to be like that guy. The meth project is having significant impact outside of the state of Montana, not only in the Senate and the Congress of the United States, but in the state of Hawaii, the state of Utah, the state of Arizona, the state of Tennessee, all of which have expressed an interest in adopting our technologies within their states. This is very, very exciting. I'm going to try meth just once. I'm going to smoke this just once. When the meth project was announced, we once. believed this was the largest cause-related effort of this kind in any state ever conducted. Or today, I am satisfied. I'm going to try meth just once. Uh, I'm absolutely satisfied that this is a program that is going to have significant impact in the state of Montana. And I believe today that this will have significant impact on many, many other areas in the United States that are suffering from a methamphetamine crisis. Great work. Well, to find out more about the Montana Meth Project, go to their website at www.montanameth.org. Oh, guys, that was so powerful. I was having trouble sitting in my seat watching those ads. What do you guys think? Well, they're, they're obviously very graphic. Uh, I think it's a bold move on Montana's part. It's going to be interesting to watch the evaluations after six months, a year, two years, and, and see what the, the long-term impact is. What do you think, Jim? Uh, I think they're great. And not only that, they're realistic uh, in, in terms of what happens to people when they're using methamphetamine. I think the message, don't even try meth just once, is really powerful as well. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. It was love at first dose for me, you know. That's the way it was. And I, I don't think that that, you know, that they, they, they are. They're very graphic, but they are not outside of the realm of what happens at all. And I knew nothing the first time I did it, you know. I didn't know what it was. Knowledge is power, and that's not hysterical. Right. Well, hopefully this will, you know, raise awareness, which is what we all want to do on programs like this one today. And then when we do raise awareness, we need to help people get help. So let's talk just a moment about treatment. Um, I know you are working on, in Casper, bringing a new treatment facility to your community. Tell us about that. One of the things that it, it's been brought up here today, and we see it time and time again, is 28-day or short-term treatment projects simply do not work. Uh, one of the components that's missing in Wyoming is, is the capacity for long-term residential treatment. Uh, we have waited long enough. It's something that we need in Casper, and we are... Uh, looking strongly at moving ahead and building a long-term residential facility. Good for you. I hope that works out well for you. Um, let's talk a little bit about drug testing because I know that um, that is considered a deterrent in a lot of communities. Let's talk about what Casper is doing with drug testing. Casper is fortunate in that the energy industry, oil industry is big in Casper and they have been leaders in drug testing for years and years. Uh, we have kind of drawn a line in the sand in Casper and said if you are going to live and work in Casper, you will have to be drug free. We have over 160 businesses that have signed up, signed up and are doing random drug testing now. Uh, we have another businessman's luncheon coming up here this next uh, next week, uh, where we'll have more businesses signing on. So we think it's absolutely critical that that you drug test in a community to stop this. You have to send a clear message. And what about your billboards that you have in your community? The billboards have been very effective. In our, our community, basically, Casper uh, salutes the following businesses for drug testing, and, and we list their names. And we're at a point now when a, a business is drug testing and they don't see their name, they'll call and say, hey, where am I? Which <laughs> billboard? Where are we going to be? So, uh, But that's what you have to have is that, that, that energy and enthusiasm for it. Have you guys had experience with, Vicki, have you had experience with drug testing? At we, that's point. what we measure when we're doing the research, is how many clean UAs versus how many, um, how many dirty urinalysis. So we measure them. And some research has shown that contingent, contingency management, which is basically providing incentives for people for having clean UAs, 
Um, what is a UA? Um, your analysis. Okay. Right. <laughs> Thank you. Um, <laughs> so if, if you provi actually provide an incentive for someone to, to have a, a, a negative your analysis, that, that it has been effective. We actually have a partnership at CADCA with a group called Famatech, and they make an at-home drug testing product, and they've just put meth as one of the screens for that product, and you can buy it at the grocery store. Um, do you guys think that would be an effective tool? I, I don't know, uh, but, you know, it's kind of interesting. As long as the meth problem has been around, it's just now coming available. Right. And it makes you wonder why it's taken so long. Been a little slow to react, you yes, think? Yes, it maybe? has, yeah. Right. Groups like NACO, the National Association of Counties, they've been really out in front with them, uh, with this problem. Have you had any experience with them? We have. I've actually read their study and, and talked to a couple of the individuals. And that, but that's, again, it's a public awareness. It's a public education. You're... Your public has to understand the problems of working with a, a drug-induced co-worker. They have to understand the problems with moving into an apartment or a house that has been used to cook uh, meth or, or use meth. So it's all educational, and that's, that's, uh, we have to continue on the public awareness. Now, is law enforcement proactive or reactive when it comes to methamphetamine? Jim, what do you think? I know in Missouri we're extremely proactive, and, and that's one of the big reasons why we have such huge numbers of meth lab incidents uh, reported to EPIC uh, because we saw early in the mid-90s uh, the problem coming and uh, and I have to give the Missouri Highway Patrol some credit that they were really proactive about getting the training for every member of the Missouri State Highway Patrol and then extending that training to uh, counties and cities uh, so because uh, frankly a lot of law enforcement officers weren't aware of what a meth lab looked like. Right. And once we began doing that, then our meth lab seizures skyrocketed and, and remain actually high to this day. Well, since we're talking about numbers, let's take a look at some statistics from 2002 and 2005, then after that, of the Klan lab incident reports. Yeah, Missouri is huge on here. What, what do you have to say to this thing? Well, actually, for the last five years, uh, Missouri has actually led the nation in meth lab incidents as reported to the El Paso Intelligence Center, who's responsible for uh, maintaining uh, the data of, of meth lab incidents. If you just take the states that border Missouri, that touch Missouri, we account for over 50 percent of the meth lab incidents reported nationwide. Mm -hmm. But as, as Tom mentioned earlier, this situation is moving east rapidly and I've been doing training on the East Coast for several years and it's gone from uh, from 10 years ago telling the East Coast that there's a meth problem it's coming and then telling me that that it's not here to now it's overwhelming if you look at uh, North Carolina just in 2002 if if you looked at the stat they reported uh, 48 meth lab incidents. Uh, in 2005, it was over 300. Wow. Yeah, when we talk to coalition leaders on the East Coast in many communities, they're just gearing up for this. They are trying to uh, put some uh, pieces of information out there, talk to parents. What sort of advice, since you're really doing a coalition approach, uh, Tom, what advice would you have to coalition leaders? The first thing they're going to have to do is determine the data for their area specific what is the scope of the problem and, and, uh, and what resources do they have available? And secondly, they will have to understand that they, while law enforcement is certainly a necessary and important part of the picture, they are not going to be able to arrest their way out of the problem. They are going to have to have long-term residential treatment programs in place which are expensive and they probably don't have the capacity for them now, but their treatment needs are not going to work until they have long-term residential. I think it's yeah. so encouraging that law enforcement has that attitude, too, because it, for myself, it required legal intervention to get me into treatment for the final time that works. So when, so when, the, for, when law enforcement understands that their intervention will help somebody get the treatment that they need, then they're providing a real service to the community. Now, what about rural treatment? Is there special concerns there? Absolutely. In southwest Iowa, where I'm from, there was, there went, treatment was an outpatient basis one day a week one-on-one -on -one with a counselor for one hour and that's simply not enough when you have a serious meth addiction um, in order to get people the treatment I don't know what we're gonna do I mean building a long-term <laughs> residential facility is one thing but somehow we have to get the treatment to the people you, you are going to pay for it 
you're going to pay for the problem. Do you want to pay for it on the front end or the back end? Do you want a possibility for success, or do you, or you just want to keep building more and more prisons? I mean, it's and one of the biggest problems is is I encounter these people day in day out. Even those that want treatment find that the treatment centers are full, and they're they have a six month wait or an eight month wait just to get in and during that period guess what they're relapsing right. and then by the time they the space opens they've already back into it and they've forgotten all about treatment mm -hmm. the the other thing that ties in with that is as effective as Jim is in taking down the labs and as many labs as are taken down around the country if we were able to stop labs completely tomorrow we would still have a meth problem due to the influx of Mexican meth that comes into the country the, the availability of it is almost endless. Right. So what are lawmakers doing, guys? Well, uh, on, a, on a state level, uh, I know at least 17 states nationwide have implemented Sudafed legislation requiring the sales of Sudafedrin uh, to take place at a pharmacy rather than at a convenience store, and those sales are monitored and they're logged and uh, this, they're limited. As well, the, uh, within the Patriot Act that, that recently passed, uh, there is what's called the Combat Meth Act that on a federal level uh, limits the amount of pseudofedrin that can be purchased at a pharmacy. So what we've done is decreased significantly, significantly the amount of methamphetamine that the local producer can make. Right. So we've got to work on our own demand for the drugs. We've got to work on drugs coming in across our borders. We're working very hard. I know law enforcement's working very hard on r reducing the labs here in the United States and helping people that need treatment. What would be the best way that we can prevent people from ever trying meth? Well, I think knowledge is power. Certainly what Montana's doing with their ads is a way, you know, it, it might be scare factor, but it, it's a scary thing. And to keep one person from trying it once, I think is, is huge. What would you say? Well, again, you have to go back to community awareness. You have to make people have to understand the scope of this problem. This is not the problem we've had with alcohol and 28 day programs. This is a big, big picture, long term problem. Jim, what would you say? You know, what's really hard is that a lot of parents are manufacturing methamphetamine with children in the home. And not only that, they're having the children assist them in the manufacture. So, what do you do? to stop that type of situation and, and for that I, I really have no answer. I don't know what to tell you. Well hopefully we've discussed a lot of the, the issues surrounding meth. We covered a lot in one hour. Um, so we're going to give the folks at home some resources. I'm sorry to say that's all the time we have for you today. Thanks for watching. As we leave we'll show you some important internet resources that can help you and your coalition melt the ice. When it's about to blow apart Can you feel it pounding? Drive that message home I'm only human I need you to go on I'm only human I need you to go on I am only human, I'm down here on my knees. Sometimes I know what I am doing, sometimes I'm blowing with the breeze. When I think I know the reason, I'm sure I hear the rhyme. Sometimes it feels like treason in my body and my mind. Sometimes it feels like treason in my body and my mind. We are only human. We try to get it straight. Maybe we'll stop what we are doing before it is too late.